Logic is the beginning of wisdom, not the end of it. That is a quote by Mr. Spock, who is someone I really admire. Over the past few months, I have produced videos about a lot of dog-related issues. As much as possible, I have provided references and scientific evidence for the arguments I have made. At times, it has been difficult because of some of the material I have had to look at. I have had to look at photos of dog maulings and the results of zoonotic infections passed from dogs to humans. I have had to read about the callous disregard for human safety that some dog owners have. I have read preposterous claims about what dogs supposedly contribute to human society. What has also been troubling me is the attachment that dog worshippers have to faulty logic. Because they are invested in faulty logic, it becomes almost impossible to reason or argue with them. I would like to talk about some of the logical fallacies and twisted argument tricks that dog worshippers use. So what is a logical fallacy? A logical fallacy refers to the use of faulty reasoning in the construction of an argument. It may come about as a result of deliberate deception, or it may come about through ignorance. Dog worshippers will often just repeat a phrase or slogan in an attempt to win an argument, not knowing that the slogan is a logical fallacy. For example, how often have you come across any of the following three slogans? There is no such thing as a bad dog. It's the way the dog was raised. Or, pit bulls were once used as nanny dogs. It is impossible to prove the first two claims, and the third one is a downright lie. I ask myself, if dogs are so wonderful, why don't they prove it? It can be scientifically proved that dogs are mammals and have a number of qualities common to other mammals and some qualities that identify them as dogs. But that's not the issue here. Dog lovers claim that dogs have special qualities that no other animals have. They claim that dogs love us, protect us, nurture us, and will, if called upon, give up their lives for us. But where is the proof? Dog worshippers are shy of providing proof. They much prefer us to provide proof of our point of view so that they can criticize our proof. They have a few stock phrases such as your argument is flawed or the statistics are wrong, but they never explain in what way the argument is flawed or the statistics are wrong. There are very few large-scale peer-reviewed studies into those non-biological aspects of dogs. In the absence of evidence, dog lovers have a few tricks up their sleeves. For example, there's anecdotal evidence, or arguing from the specific to the general. They will describe one dog, often their own, and claim that one dog is typical of all dogs. This is arguing from the specific to the general. For example, they'll say, I had a pit bull for 10 years, and it was the sweetest, most loyal dog you could ever meet. It wouldn't harm a fly. So you are wrong in saying that pit bulls are dangerous. They will even use works of fiction as anecdotal evidence. There's also cherry picking. They will select which studies suit them while ignoring contradictory evidence. How many times have we read that dogs reduce your blood pressure? It is now presented as a well-established scientific fact. How many times have you seen references provided so that you can look up the facts for yourself? If you were able to look up the facts for yourself, you may come to a different conclusion. I discuss this in detail in this video here uh, that I made about how scientific research shakes the idea that dogs make us healthier. Uh, you might want to check that out. If you haven't seen it already, the blood pressure example leads to another fallacy, and that is the correlation causation fallacy. Because things are related to each other, it doesn't mean that one caused the other. Many of the studies looking into the effect of dogs on blood pressure were small scale and were funded by organizations with an interest in dogs, or they used dog owners as subjects. Would the same dog have a similar effect on someone who does not like dogs, for example? 
Could the blood pressure lowering be related to the presence of the dog handler in some way? Does the breed or size or furriness of the dog make any difference? The mechanism by which the dog lowers the blood pressure is never defined in any precise way. Many things, not just the dog, could have caused the lowering of the blood pressure. A variation on this is when they give a motive to the dog's behavior that they can't possibly know. What is this dog doing? If you said that the dog was staying by its owner even after death, you would be wrong. Death caused the absence of the owner. But did it cause that particular behavior in the dog? This photo could have been staged. In fact, it does look more like a surveyor's marking post than a grave. This type of thing is commonly provided by dog worshippers as proof of dog loyalty. When a dog lies down beside a coffin, it is supposedly grieving. No, it's not. It's lying down for some dog lying down reason. The death of the owner is not the cause. Bringing a dog to a funeral or a grave site is an unusual thing to do. So what's the usual dog behavior for such an event? Humans behave unusually at funerals, so this will affect dog behavior. And this leads us to the Texas sharpshooter fallacy. The name comes from a joke about a Texan who fires his gun into the side of a barn, then paints a target around the bullet holes and claims he is a marksman. Dog worshippers do it all the time. They highlight one dog behavior and ignore all of the evidence that contradicts it. For every dog that lies down, apparently grieving at a graveside, how many dogs piss, shit, or fight at the graveside? Dog behavior is unrelated to the death. It is not caused by it. For every dog that apparently lies in a loyal and protecting manner, how many dogs eat their owner when they die? And where is the loyalty in that? We are all familiar with the hero dog. The dog that saves a family by alerting them to what is happening is hailed as a hero and may get honorary firefighter status. What about dogs that attack firefighters or prevent them from doing their work by growling, lunging, and barking aggressively? What about dogs that attack their rescuers? When we hear about dogs attacking their rescuers, the stories usually have an explanation. The dog's behavior is usually explained away in terms of the dog being distressed or misinterpreting the actions of the rescuers. How do they know about the dog's motives? They know because they are failing Occam's razor. Occam's razor is a problem-solving technique that helps you decide when explanations are least likely, and reject them, then move on to the most likely. It is sometimes explained as the simplest explanation is the most likely. But simple explanations can also be wrong. It's a guard against being over complex. Again and again, dog worshippers fail Occam's razor by going for the most complex and least likely explanation. When a dog barks during a fire, it is doing so because it is frightened and wants to be rescued. To claim that the dog is making complicated, rational, moral, and altruistic decisions to save and rescue members of another species is far too complicated to be a reasonable explanation. But that's the explanation we are given time and time again. In 2007, when the celebrated Khan the Wonder Dog supposedly attacked a venomous snake to save the life of a toddler, there were other possible explanations why Khan attacked the snake. Dogs don't need the presence of a child to attack reptiles or any other kind of animal for that matter. Go on YouTube and see videos of dogs attacking porcupines, pigs, cows, horses, snakes, lizards, deer, sea lions, bison, sheep, humans of all ages, cats, other dogs, and so on. 
There are even videos of them attacking inanimate objects. There is not a single toddler in danger in any of those videos. To claim that Khan saved the child's life is to fail Occam's razor, because it is not the most reasonable or the most likely explanation for the dog's behavior. It attacked the snake for its own reasons. When a dog owner comes home and their dog gets excited and overactive, they come to the conclusion that the dog is behaving in this way because it loves them. This, again, is far too complicated of an explanation. Other, less complex explanations are more likely, but dog owners choose the most complicated and least likely explanation. For example, that the dog loves them. This leads them to look for complicated truth and to get stuck with the oxytocin as love hormone nonsense. Dog owners are careful never to be precise about what they mean by love. Surely we deserve an explanation for this extraordinary claim that a predatory carnivore would have feelings of love for a potential prey animal that has genetically modified them for a lifetime of pain and disability, imprisoned them, and will control their movements and activities for the rest of their life. That's not much of a basis of love. If you ask for proof that their dog loves them, the most likely responses will involve circular reasoning. What appears to be an explanation is just a restating of their original statement. An example would be, I know my dog loves me because he is excited to see me. He gets excited because he loves me. Nothing is explained here. Another example would be, dogs are great because they are wonderful. They believe that their dogs love them and they want us to accept that belief without question. In religion, this would be called faith. In other settings, it's called argument from ignorance. Something is argued to be true because it is generally accepted or it hasn't been proven to be false. This argument that dogs love their owners is repeated and repeated until it is generally accepted as true. If you offer proof against it or offer another explanation for dog behavior, then that proof is rejected. When a dog barks at you or lunges and jumps at you, the owner will often tell you that it is being friendly or it is saying hello or it is wanting to play with you. Since dogs can't talk or otherwise communicate clearly to humans, then there is no proof that any of this is true. Their proof is that there is no proof that it is not true. If dog lovers claim that their beliefs about dogs are true, it should be their responsibility to provide that proof. It shouldn't be ours to provide the opposite. This is known as the burden of proof fallacy. Dog lovers make astonishing claims that are without proof. One of their claims is that when any dog mauls or kills a human, it is not the fault of the dog because the dog has either not been raised correctly or has been abused by humans in the past. No proof is offered here for something that would be impossible to prove anyway. They make the claim and leave it to others to disprove. What has never been proven is offered up for proof. There is no such thing as a bad dog, they say. This is another statement that shifts the burden of proof. You will notice that a definition of what constitutes bad is never provided. How do dog worshippers react to criticism? First port of call is usually to shoot the messenger, also known as ad hominem fallacy. This will be familiar to all of you. If you dare to say publicly that you do not like dogs, you are told that you have no soul, or you are crazy or disgusting, and they pity you. You will all have seen these memes, often with Bill Murray's head saying, I don't trust anyone who doesn't like dogs. 
These memes will often be posted when anyone criticizes dogs or their owners or states that they don't like being jumped on, barked at, or bitten. Sometimes these ad hominem attacks can be very threatening and offensive. The user of the ad hominem comment may go for the psychological jugular and cause as much hurt as possible. Some of the comments I have had directed to me are too offensive to repeat. These comments can and do escalate to death threats. For example, pit bulls are the sweetest, most gentle dogs on the planet. And if you disagree with that, you deserve to be torn apart by pit bulls. When a well-packaged web of lies has been sold gradually to the masses over generations, the truth will seem utterly preposterous and its speaker a raving lunatic. Those are the words of Dresden James. Another approach is the bandwagon fallacy. This is when they argue that you must be wrong because most people agree with them. A certain percentage are dog owners and you can't disagree with so many people. You are outnumbered. This ignores the reality that because a lot of people agree with something doesn't make it right. There are plenty of examples in history to illustrate this. For example, general belief that witchcraft was the cause of physical illness. Sometimes the bandwagon fallacy is strengthened by the appeal to authority fallacy. Getting someone powerful, famous, or influential to agree with them adds weight to their arguments, but it still doesn't make the arguments right. I've already done a video on the use of Patrick Stewart in this manner. The actor who played Captain Jean-Luc Picard loves pit bulls, so that makes them okay. Another type of appeal is the appeal to pity fallacy. This is the appeal to the emotions used by a sob story or a picture to dodge logic. Common examples are pit bulls with tutus or floral tiaras, photos of newly born puppies, placing large dogs beside human infants, and calling dogs of all ages puppies, or making up childish names for the species such as doggo or pupper or pibble. Infantilizing dogs is an appeal to pity. When any town considers tightening their dog control policies, the local newspapers and social media receive stories about elderly, lonely people who rely on their dog for companionship and who would be devastated by these new laws or restrictions. I could go on and on, and many of you will be able to identify other examples of false logic used by dog worshippers, but I just want to end with one final one, and that is the not-as-bad fallacy, also known as the fallacy of relative privation. Dogs aren't so bad because something else is much worse, so let's forget about dogs. Here are some examples you are likely to have come across. My dog has as much right to come into your restaurant as anyone. It's much cleaner than most humans I know. Or it's better behaved than any kids. Cars kill a lot more people than dogs, so you should ban cars. Dogs are much better than humans because dogs don't start wars or drop bombs. Chihuahuas are more dangerous than pit bulls. I have covered manipulation of statistics, outright lies, and some other tricks in some of my other videos. So I'll leave it there, and I wish you all a dog-free future.